everybody. Oh, we're waiting here. Here, Bo. Got tech support with me here again tonight. Oh my goodness. There he is. Little Boker. <laughs> He's my buddy. <laughs> <laughs> he helped me figure out the screen sharing. <laughs> helped me figure out connectivity. Rachel Ray Nutrition has kitchen inspired recipes with real meat, poultry, or fish. Rachel Ray Nutrition. Real recipes, real ingredients, real good. Just go to 2020census.gov. Nice haircut. <laughs> oh, it's just Oh, here. never mind. Oh, you tricked us. <laughs> yeah, it'll probably, it'll be all down by the time this is over. It was in my face, I couldn't see a thing. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, here it comes already. I thought I had air ties here, but I haven't been able to find them. Uh, I've been slowly unpacking here. It's, it's no longer a new office. I've been here now since uh, August of last year, but uh, another box I hadn't gotten to yet. And um, I don't know if I'll find use for this tonight or not, but the desk is complete without a duck ball. <laughs> Keep it handy just in case. Um, and then um, I went into the uh, the nature archives uh, for some visual aids here. Let me test this out on you guys before we get going. Does this work? Can you see that okay? Yeah. Maybe I'll make it a full screen. Can you see what it is? Yes, yeah, yeah, we're gonna start off with cicadas again. All right, I'll practice with that a little bit. Just, I don't have my video on because I'm eating. Waiting.
Well, folks, it's eight o'clock. Let's say we get going. Um, like to welcome you all back for the second week of Good Natured. We actually have four more participants this week than we did last week. So you're doing your homework. This is great. The more we can build this up, the, uh, the greater chance we'll have that we can do this for free in the future. If we can get a couple of sponsors, then you guys can join in um, at absolutely no cost. But as it is right now, I really appreciate you contributing to uh, the health and welfare of the animals at Hickory Knolls. Uh, we'll get things rolling with our, our intro. We've got a couple more people, looks like, are starting to sign in. Um, so I will play a little music and uh, we'll get the show on the road. All right. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to follow kind of the same pattern we did last week where we'll review what was on um, what was in the column this past week. And um, then we'll run through what all the local nature news is. Uh, so if, if you had a chance to read last week's column, you'll know that uh, what I found in my mom's uh, yard was, in fact, cicadas. It wasn't prey fish the way I'd been thinking for several weeks. Um, but I uh, found that that little uh, shed shell, let me show you one of these here, of a cicada. Um, I, I couldn't believe it because it really uh, did not occur to me because cicadas normally, you know, we have our annual cicadas and they come out every, uh, every year now. Uh, annual cicadas. In fact, let me pull up a slide here. When we're talking about the difference between periodical and uh, annual cicadas, um, it's more than just um, their uh, when they appear. There's some some real physical differences. Now, this uh, red-eyed creature here is uh, a periodical cicada. We see them. Um, every 17 years. Now, across the country, we have 17-year uh, and 13-year cicadas, and they're grouped into uh, broods. And in this area, what's called brood 13. Um, there's now a brood can consist of multiple species, and, and we won't spend a lot of time talking about um, you know all the 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 finer points of identifying these different species, but there can be up to three different species in a brood. Uh, there's two that are very common. One is, a, it's called Cassini and it's, it's very small. Um, and then there's Septendisim, which means 17 year. Um, and it's a little bit larger. Um, and when you look at these guys, they, uh, they've got a lot of orange, they've got brighter colors uh, contrasting with their black head and the, uh, the orange bands down their abdomen. But um, they are uh, really kind of a, a baffling sort of an insect. There's a lot of theories as to why they've adopted this 17 year cycle, but there's not a lot of agreement in the scientific community about why that is. Um, some feel that it, it goes back to the ice age and um, when things were colder out, it took longer for these insects to develop. Um, combined with that, uh, there's the, uh, the predator satiation theory, which, um, the hypothesis that states that if enough of these insects come out at one time, then um, the predators will get eat all they can and there will still be enough individuals to survive to carry on the species. So chances are things so oftentimes go, it's probably a combination of those factors. Um, what that doesn't explain though is what happened in the Chicago area in 1969. We, don't know exactly how a, a pretty large subset of brood 13 kind of got off schedule. They emerged after 13 years. Uh, now again, there's a lot of hypotheses of why that happened. Um, uh, it could have been uh, ex several years of what would be considered good growing conditions for insects, uh, warm weather, a lot of moisture. Um, 
um, not too much moisture, they would drown. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, in 1969, these characters decided, we're going to come up four years early. And even though they were four years early, they're still referred to as a straggler kind of subset of brood 13. Now, those um, years they spent underneath the ground um, are actually quite similar to uh, what we see in our um, of our annual cicada here. Um, you can uh, see on the front here, you can kind of see, um, these insects have a, a long kind of a drinking straw for a mouth and it's, it's um, very similar to um, uh, what you'd see on a juice box. It's pointed at one end and it can pierce through a tissue um, in the cicadas case, though, it's not going into a Capri Sun, it's going into a tree root. Uh, that's where it will slurp um, uh, juices, sap from the tree for, on the periodical case, 17 years. And the annual cicadas, despite us calling them annual, um, they don't really have a, a neat one-year life cycle. They are underground for multiple years, um, but there's not really been a, a solid uh, look at the different, and we have many different species of annual cicadas, but uh, the, the general estimate is two to five years that they're underground, still a really long time for an insect. Um, but they're down there living off of the, uh, the plant roots, uh, the tree roots, and then they come up um, as uh, the conditions warrant. Now, the periodical cicadas east of here, east of Kane County, there were uh, some pretty sizable emergencies, emergencies over the last few weeks in uh, Elmhurst and Lombard. Um, there were uh, a lot in South uh, Cook County, in Northern Will County. There was a few up in Lake County. Now, I tried really hard here in Kane County to uh, find uh, what I could, and I did find a few shells. I'm going to hold this up. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen here. Um, this is what I found around here. Um, this is a uh, what would be a the Cassini periodical cicada. You might be thinking, okay, big deal. So what? Uh, well, here, in contrast, this is an annual cicada shell. So you can see the longer, narrower abdomen. Uh, this one is a lot thicker. Um, and uh, the uh, annual cicadas, we should be due to hear them now. I keep forgetting how late it is. It's almost the end of June. These guys typically by 4th of July are starting to come out. Um, we'll probably do another a uh, little blurb on cicadas as these start to appear because there are several species and um, there are ways to tell the difference. Looking at them, it's actually harder to tell the difference than it is listening to them. It's kind of neat. They partition their days. There's some annual cicadas that call earlier in the day, some that call in the middle of the day, some that call uh, towards the end of the day. So you can start to listen. One's called a scissors grinder. Um, there's a, a lot of different um, cadences to their sounds. So, uh, like I said, this is something that we will probably revisit before the end of summer. I'm going to hold this up one more time because there is just something that I think is the coolest thing. Can you see those front legs on these guys? These are made for digging. Um, they dig down and then they dig back up, but once the adult insect is out and above ground, they don't have digging forelegs anymore. They just have regular insect legs. Uh, we'll look at that again as these guys emerge, but it's just something of uh, endlessly fascinating things that we want to talk about cicadas. These other cicada shells, um, I've got quite a few of them here. I collected um, oh, several dozen at my mom's the other week. I'll hold up a handful so you can see what I do with my spare time. Um, that was from this year's emergence, but I also, I went, um, I realized that I, I had a goal back in 2007, which is the last time the periodical cicadas came out. I was going to make earrings from the wings. Uh, I haven't gotten around to it yet, but I still saved them. <laughs> and um, it's on my to-do list to dip them in varnish and one day have some cicada wing 
earrings. Something you can try too. <laughs> All right, um, let's let's uh, move on to a different topic. Um, I get kind of fired up about a lot of different things that. Um, well, I guess if you find if you are here, you must find it interesting too. But I, I wanted to show you one of my favorite uh, plants here. Um, let's see, where did I put it? Here we go. Um, we're gonna take a look at this plant. Um, yeah. Here's a little video I made in my backyard. I don't know if you can recognize this shrub. Uh, from its leaves and from its large flower heads. Um, but this is elderberry. Uh, and I tell you, I, I planted a couple of these several years ago. My house is, it's a 1970s home. It was, um, came equipped with a lot of 1970s landscaping, including a lot of honeysuckle, which as we know now is a, a highly invasive shrub. It, it takes over the understory in our local woods. So I, I wanted something that was fairly quick growing and would fill in the space that was left by these, uh, the honeysuckle. So I, I chose elderberry and um, it did fill in quickly. In fact, this is the kind of shrub that um, I love having it around, but it is uh, something that takes a pretty heavy hand uh, with a set of uh, loppers and uh, even a pruning saw because it's constantly shooting up new canes and shoots and um, taking over uh, places that it, it um, maybe isn't quite as welcome. My big mistake when I planted it was I put one on either side of the gate into my backyard and um, you know, to get back there with the lawnmower, I usually, in fact, just last weekend, I was doing battle with, with some of the new growth of the elderberry. And then if I don't stay on top of it, then I get those little nasty gram uh, red tags from the meter readers because they can't fight through the jungle to get back to where my meter is. So I, I do try to stay on top of it. But with all that said, this is a wonderful plant. If you've ever um, done any reading about the uh, health properties uh, and the uh, immune boosting properties of elderberries, uh, I got sold on it a few years ago. I make elderberry syrup now every year using the berries and uh, local honey. And um, I also tried my hand at elderberry wine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you ever want to try some, let me know. I've got uh, two and a half bottles left, um, and I only made three. But um, it's, it's a neat plant. There's a lot of opportunity to do things with it. And now is the time. In fact, this window is going to be closing uh, very shortly. But uh, you can harvest these elder flowers and make all kinds of things with them. You can make elderflower fritters. Uh, there's uh, a couple of uh, mead types of drinks that you can make with elderflowers. Well, I don't know, I'm not so much into frying and I, I was just looking for something simple and refreshing that I could do. And I found this recipe uh, for elderflower cordial. Um, and it takes a, a fair amount of elderberry, but you, you can see how large these elderflower heads are. Uh, I believe the recipe I had here, um, Let's see, you have 15 elderflower heads, which um, actually um, is pretty easy to harvest. I would say I've got a few hundred heads in my yard right now. Um, if you're curious about this recipe, um, you can just Google easy elderflower cordial. This is the, um, should be the first recipe that, that pops up. If not, you can find it on veganonboard.com. Um, I, I, I don't know, some of you might remember uh, my former life was in the food industry. So when I see a recipe, my first instinct is to try and change it. Uh, so I, I looked at this recipe. I liked the fact that it was easy. But then I also um, looked around for some other ways to do it. And I did make some adaptations. Uh, one person had noted that uh, elderflower can lose its delicate flavor if it gets heated too warm. So uh, in this, um, recipe, it calls for uh, infusing the water uh, with elderflowers um, through boiling. And I thought, well, you know, if it's going to lose its flavor, I don't want to boil them. So I actually made my simple syrup 
uh, with the lemon and the citric acid. And then I poured it, uh, let it cool a little bit. And then I poured it over the elderflowers. Um, there is an important uh, step in these directions. It's um, very first one. It's check elderflowers for dirt and little insects. So I did that and uh, let's see how do I get this to advance. It's going to be hung up here. Um, there we go. Look at what I found. Um, so these, this is the stems. Uh, that's uh, something else. That if you're thinking about cooking with either the berries or the uh, flowers, the stems and the leaves of the plant are uh, toxic. They, I, I don't think they'll kill you, but they'll probably make you wish you were dead. Um, so you want to cut the uh, the flower heads off as close as you can to the uh, the actual blossoms. But as I was trimming, um, I found not one but two of these little characters. And those of you who are with us last week, you might recall we talked about the difference between caterpillars and uh, sawflies. So I was looking at this little creature, and um, if you can look closely here, you're going to see one, two, three. Uh, true legs, and we'll just assume that there's three more over there. That makes six, so it's an insect. Uh, but then right behind these uh, actual legs up front, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, there's a couple more back here, nine, ten. There's a lot of what are called pro legs. They, uh, these are the, the sticky legs. Uh, if you've ever looked at the underside of a caterpillar, you know. They've got these these kind of uh, fleshy legs that are not going to be part of the grown-up butterfly or moth. Well, it's the same with sawflies, except sawflies always have all these extra pro legs. So if you find something that's got, in this case, uh, eight or ten pro legs, uh, if uh, you know you're not looking at an actual at a caterpillar, but rather a sawfly larva. Sawflies are in the wood wasp uh, group. And I, I have not uh, keyed this out yet to see just what sort of sawflies I have living on uh, my uh, elderberry. I only found two, so I'm not too worried. I don't think my elderberries are going anywhere. Sometimes if you get a heavy infestation of sawflies, they'll defoliate the tree and, and you're left with nothing. But anyway, uh, to try and stay on point with our recipe, if you are making elderflower cordial, do check those stems and um, return any anything that's not uh, an elderflower back to nature. I put the sawflies back out on the elderberry bush and I put the um, stems underneath just in case there were other insects I missed. They could maybe find their way back up into the branches. So um, here's um, my calendar. Uh, it, this recipe says not to wash um, the elderflowers, and I, I, uh, I know why they're saying that, I get why they're saying that. Um, there's a lot of pollen on these flowers that's going to contribute to the flavor of your cordial, so you don't want to rinse it all away. You want to keep it um, as much as possible. So picking them late morning uh, when the dew is dried off of them, um, that's the time that's recommended. Uh, this is more or less 15 cups. I might have had a few extras that I added in as well. Um, it's hard to measure volume when you're measuring flowers, but um, I uh, made a simple syrup over on the stove uh, with uh, uh, that's uh, a cup of, uh, I actually I used two to one, I used two cups of water to one cup of sugar, and then I thought, you know, some honey would be good, so I substituted some honey for some of the sugar. Um, and I, I boiled it and then I let it cool and then I packed um, a pickle jar. Um, in fact, I've got my, my good neighbors, the Tillmans, to ask for these jars, uh, to, to thank for these jars. Uh, this is um, a, a gallon's worth of uh, elderflower cordial getting ready to, um, to steep. So uh, there's the lemon. The recipe um, that I liked that I showed you earlier, it also calls for citric acid, which you can find in the, uh, the canning of a store. I got mine at Menards, but food grade citric acid will help 
uh, the cordial mixture lasts longer and uh, adds a little bit of tang to the um, finished product as well. So um, you know, it's kind of a tradition on YouTube now. Um, the, uh, there's people that they do unboxing videos. Uh, what I thought it might be fun to do would be to try a uh, uncorking video. I've got a cup here with some ice in it. I've got uh, some elderflower cordial. I'm gonna pour it in. It says one to five dilution. So I'm gonna go up to about here with my cordial. I don't know if any of you wanna dial nine and one and then call quick dial the other one if this doesn't work out. <laughs> but like I said, I, I think I got all the stems out of there. All right, we're gonna pour this in. This is uh, bubbly water, which is bubbly, but I'm technically working, so I have to just go with the bubbly water. Got my sustainable steel straw here. Um, it's pretty good. It's, um, oh, here's a test for you. Not too tart, not too sweet. Anybody remember that? Country Time Lemonade. Um, I'm going to add just a little bit more fizzy water here. Um, it's got a, uh, it's got the tang from the lemon and the citric acid, but there's a, a very flowery essence to this as well. Yeah, I wish I could share it with you. If you're in the neighborhood, stop by um, 213 Walnut Street. I'll keep this in the refrigerator. <laughs> anyway. Nature went to the kitchen this week. We might try it again uh, another time, especially if I find some cool mushrooms or something, edible mushrooms. Um, let's, let's move on. Um, kind of along the lines of this uh, flowery essence, uh, I, I wanted to come up with a, a catchy title for this segment, and all I could think of was, what's that smell? So we're going to go with that until I can come up with something new. Um, but uh, in this case, it is actually a very, very um, pleasant smell. And I, I love this time of year because of this. Uh, let's pull this picture up. Um, this, anybody recognize uh, this particular tree? Uh, we've got uh, some heart-shaped leaves here, a little bit of gloss to them. These flowers are going to turn into little, uh, maybe about the size of a pea. Uh, uh, a little seed case that's about the size of a pea. This is uh, basswood or linden. Depending, there's there's several different varieties. Um, Tilia americana is the American basswood. That would be the native version. Linden is the um, the common name for some of the uh, um, introduced species, but they're very frequently uh, planted on parkways. Um, the, there's a little leaf linden, there's, there's a few different types of linden, but I tell you, the fragrance of this flower is just absolutely heavenly. I've been walking to work this week with uh, a little boker, Mr. Tech Support down here, who's sleeping on my feet now, but uh, I just love this time of year. And I noticed today that uh, there's a lot of little flower parts now laying on the ground, so I know we're getting towards the end of uh, basswood season, but if you get a chance, uh, even tonight, because I, I, I want to say that um, these flowers open up at night. I, I, maybe it's just because it's more humid at night, but this fragrance is just so, it, it, uh, almost like those cartoons, you know, where the, the uh, uh, scent um, wafts through the air and grabs the cartoon character by the nose and off they go. I, I just, I spend a lot of time when I'm walking the dogs uh, sniffing out basswood. Uh, beekeepers like to plant their uh, or place their their uh, honeybee hives near basswood because uh, of the flavor that these flowers impart to the honey. Uh, some places you can even look for and buy uh, basswood honey where the bees have um, collected almost uh, basswood nectar almost exclusively. So uh, that's number one on the uh, the nature news this week. Um, we're going to go from this to uh, a slightly less uh, appealing topic, the dirty bird bath. Um, this is uh, what I found this morning. Um, I, 
the point of this isn't the dirt in the bird bath. The point of this is the water in the bird bath, but it kind of ties into another little bit of nature news. Our uh, robins around here are, are already on their, their second uh, round, their second uh, clutch and their second brood of, of uh, child rearing at this point. And um, I can always tell when they're at it again because uh, my bird bath gets filthy with uh, bits of um, uh, grasses and mud, things like that. And we've had such little rain recently that um, finding mud is kind of hard for the robins. So having a source of water, whether it's uh, a watered lawn or uh, a bird bath is really important. Uh, I, I want to tell you though a little bit more about this, this bird bath. Um, so this is um, a little model that I got. I think I got it at Farm and Fleet. I wanted a bird bath that I could plug in in the winter and have heat. Um, water is, it's just as important and sometimes of the year even more important than, uh, than food. And I personally find it a little bit easier to maintain a bird bath than a bird feeder. Now I know we've got a lot of avid bird feeders out there in the, the audience tonight. Hi, Bob and Kathy. Uh, but um, I, right now in my life, I don't have time to keep my feeders clean, but I do have time to keep my bird bath clean. So every day I go out with, um, this is an old toothbrush, not my new toothbrush, um, and I'll, I'll scrub it out and I'll put fresh water in. And I tell you, all day long, there's birds. Uh, today, the, the goldfinches were there. Um, Actually, right over there in the, in the elderberry, I've got um, uh, some cardinals nesting, and there's a catbird on the other side of the yard in the other elderberry, and I see them coming to this bird bath as well. So I've got it. This particular model uh, clamps onto the deck, but uh, this company also makes a freestanding heated bird bath. So it's really nice. This time of year, the cord winds underneath and tucks up. Um, don't have to worry about it uh, getting rusty or anything over the course of the summertime. It doesn't get wet underneath there. And then I just run an extension cord to the outlet by uh, my back door. So really cool thing if you're thinking you want to help the birds, but you're not sure you want to uh, invest the, the time and money in bird seed. Water is something that is uh, greatly appreciated by a lot of species of birds and squirrels and opossums and raccoons. Um, so you, you will get uh, a lot of creatures coming to your party, but uh, water is very important um, uh, year round, uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Uh, now, uh, for our next item, last week, uh, you might recall if you were here, if you weren't, I'll fill you in, uh, we talked about turtles and we showed a little video about how we move turtles across the road. Well, I wanted to follow that up because we got an email this week uh, from a person here in St. Charles who uh, had a turtle in their yard and they sent us this cool video. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, uh, where did it go? Oh, it's down here at the bottom. Um, so, uh, this turtle was seen in this person's backyard. Uh, all right, let's see if we can get this video to play. This is called Turtle in Yard on YouTube. <laughs> this was up here. This person lives near Fearson Creek Fen and was really surprised to see this creature walking through the yard. It came out of the woods, uh, but as it turns out, the other side of the woods is not too far from a pretty large pond. So I'm guessing, um, let's go back and pause. Uh, I'm guessing that this turtle came out of that pond and probably was on an egg laying mission. Now, I'm, I'm uh, gonna guess that it's a female and I think she's already laid some eggs. Can you see how her feet are kind of uh, moist and uh, looks like they've got, they were in dirt recently? When, when turtles dig to lay their eggs, they use their back feet, not their front feet. Uh, they usually have nice long claws on the back. And um, these, um, it's, it just looks as though she was uh, digging down to um, almost up to where her hip is, which is about how, as deep as they go. And we're going to advance this a little bit. Further. We're going to look at her tail 
um, a male's uh, a male snapping turtle's tail is going to be a little thicker here, and it's going to be a little bit longer down here. Um, it's that works with most turtles. You can tell the difference by looking between males and females by looking at the tail. Um, so let's see. We'll just go on to the next slide. Um, this got me to thinking about what happens when turtles lay their eggs. So often around here, uh, the, the eggs don't get a chance to hatch uh, because they get dug up, usually within um, a few days to maybe a couple weeks of when they were hatched. A um, couple of reasons for that. One, the eggs themselves have a little bit of scent to them. And two, um, usually before, especially now with, with having had so little rain around here, when a female turtle goes to lay her eggs, she usually has to make the ground wet herself, if you get what I'm saying. So, so there's some scent with that as well. And um, dig this... Um, She'll, she'll dig this hole and she'll lay the eggs, she'll cover them up, and then she walks in because her mom is now done. Um, and then along comes the fox, along comes the skunk, along comes the raccoon, um, along comes the coyote. They can smell that there's an egg, uh, a turtle nest nearby with eggs in it, and they dig it up. If you come upon something like this, you can, um, it's, it's, Pretty easy to tell that this was not uh, turtles hatching. One, uh, when a turtle hatches out of its shell, it doesn't bring the shell out of the ground with it. The shell stays down in the nest. And two, when the nests get predated, it's usually, um, you know, this time of year, maybe July, uh, turtle eggs take somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 to 90 days to hatch. So, um, you know, in September, um, if a nest got predated in September, there would probably be some little bits of turtle too, because the, the turtle uh, eggs would be you know, fully developed. But um, this makes turtles very sad. So um, there's some things that we can do to help ensure the survival of turtles, but it does require some effort on our part. And this is something you, you can't really do in a, in a park or forest preserve, but if you find on your, in your own property, if you've had uh, some turtle egg laying activity, take some measures to um, protect that nest. Um, let's see if we can get this to advance. Uh, there we go. So uh, probably the simplest thing to do is to get some uh, quarter inch hardware cloth and uh, tack it down with some stakes. Now, quarter inch is preferred over half inch because uh, little turtles can sometimes get their heads through half inch hardware cloth. And uh, there's been cases where their little heads have gotten decapitated as they've tried to move through there and, and then slide back and forth. Not good. So uh, smaller is better in this case. It'll still allow uh, sunlight to come through. You don't want to tack it down super hard in case the uh, you do forget about it. Um, you want to have uh, a little bit of give to the hardware cloth so that it can um, allow the turtle to crawl up out of the nest. And uh, we're looking at a size, a square that's probably, oh, I don't know, two feet or so maybe more than that, because uh, raccoons and, and um, coyotes and, and animals like that, they can be pretty determined. So you want to make sure there's, there's plenty of hardware cloth spread beyond the, uh, the uh, edges of the nest. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's one method, and it is very simple, and it, it, it can work. Uh, the uh, uh, folks up at the uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, however, they've come up with um, another method I'm going to show you. This is, again, a video that they shared last week. Um, this is making a little bit of a cage um, to go over the turtle net. So you see they're using a little larger uh, mesh. They're using a hatchet so they can sink the cage into the ground. So 
So um, that's from, uh, like I said, Wisconsin DNR. They have um, a, a lot of videos on their website about their turtle conservation program. But um, it's something, again, if you, if you find that you have a turtle, uh, like the people that emailed us this weekend, they were so surprised. They didn't think they were anywhere near water. They were far enough away that they wouldn't have turtles on their property, and, and lo and behold, they did. So if you happen to see a nest um, uh, being dug and you wanna protect the babies, uh, there's a couple of ideas for you. Now, I will also toss out that um, snapping turtles are our most prolific species. They will usually dig at least two nests and sometimes more than that, and a female can drop, oh gosh, 30, 40 eggs in a nest. So um, I keep that in mind too. Sometimes, um, you know, letting nature take its course isn't the worst thing in the world either. Uh, but there, we also have a lot of turtle species that um, do need conservation. Our, our Blanding's turtles come to mind. Uh, we've got, um, some uh, musk turtles in the area too that could certainly use a, a helping hand. So anyway, just a couple of ideas should you find you've got a uh, turtle making a, a nest on your property. Um, now our, uh, our next topic uh, is something I, I hadn't really planned. You know, I, I, I put together an outline for these uh, these programs and I, I try to stick to it and then something happens. and. This week, the something that happened was I was working in the yard. I was actually doing uh, a little bit of cutting back, not with the elder, well, actually, yeah, some of the elderberry too, but um, got a lot of little hackberry trees that have come up around the yard. Maybe you have the same thing. The birds eat the hackberries. They drop the seeds near your, your fence line or off of another tree, and then all of a sudden, you've got all these little trees coming up. So I was cutting down a hackberry that I'd let grow a little bit too long. It was... Um, you know, probably a two inch diameter. So I needed to get the bow saw out to, to cut it down. And I'm, I'm cutting through the um, uh, hackberry and I heard a, a buzz. And I realized that the hackberry uh, was actually, um, as I was sawing on it, it was um, hitting um, an old bird feeder. Back in the day when I did feed the birds, I had a uh, bird feeder that was one of those squirrel proof feeders. You know, the squirrel lands on it and um, uh, it shuts down, looks like this. So here's the bar where the squirrel would land. Well, the spring broke um, a long time ago and it's, it's uh, I, I, I just, I don't use it anymore. So um, here's the, the hackberry was over here. I'm sawing away. I bump this, it starts to buzz. So I think, hmm, well, this is certainly interesting and bears investigating. So um, I went around uh, to the back of it and I opened it up. Slowly, so I wasn't sure what was in there. I was thinking it was paper wasps. And would you believe it? I'm going to pause this right here um, if I can. There we go. All right. So look at this. This um, is a, actually an old mouse nest. And I, I kind of laughed. Um, all those colorful bits of threads, those are from, uh, some of you might know, I, I have a, a macaw named Tommy. And um, he has some... Uh, uh, rope toys that I had put in my compost and they kind of broken down um, and I, I spread them in the garden but they didn't break down quite all the way so this mouse gathered all these little uh, bits of rope toy and made a really nice uh, protected uh, uh, nest inside this this uh, bird feeder. Well uh, bumblebees uh, happen to like to nest in rodent nests. And I don't know if they find them by scent or what, but um, there's a bumblebee nest in my bird feeder. It's just the coolest thing. I was so excited. Um, so I kind of watched them for a while and I thought, well, this is, this is pretty nice. This would make a, a nice good natured video. These, um, You'll notice that they, they don't really care that I'm watching them. By and large, that's the way bumblebees are. Now, they can get somewhat defensive 
uh, if you start to mess with them. But, uh, you know, they're just going about their business here, uh, tending to the nest. Um, the, the queen and uh, the brood that uh, they're nurturing is inside of this nest. You can see I tried to get a little rise out of them there by bumping uh, the bird feeder. Didn't run. Well, that really wasn't enough to satisfy my curiosity. So um, I tried it again. And I looked in and I said, oh yeah, there's a few more bees. And uh, if we listen, um, you can hear there's some humming. I had bumped the feeder a little bit to get them going. And I thought, oh, this still isn't getting the reaction that I wanted. So I decided I'm gonna hit the bird feeder a little bit harder. And uh, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> um, I uh, decided I better get out of there at that point. Um, but if those had been paper wasps, I would have gotten stung. I didn't get any stings at all. And it, it was just, just the neatest find. Um, bumblebees, as is the case with so many of our pollinators, um, are under threat. They're uh, subject to a lot of uh, pesticides that people use. Or the, saw another commercial the other day for broad spectrum insecticide. And I was like, ah. people who you know, are trying to kill one type of bug like the idea of broad spectrum because they thought, you know, their thinking is, well, you know, I need this. To, I need this one bug out of my life, but I may as well get rid of them all while I'm at it. And it uh, just drives me nuts. Um, there is, um, we're actually in the midst of, of pollinator week right now, and there's this really neat um, effort called Bee Spotter. It's headed um, by some folks down at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and you can learn to identify uh, different types of bees and you can send pictures in and um, they will keep track of uh, where these different species of bees are uh, occurring. Um, now there's there's a lot of information. Um, the website is beespotter.org uh, but they this front um, uh, homepage here uh, shares a lot of information about what's going on uh, with pollinators and uh, in the Midwest. And then they, they also have um, identification guides where you use um, the, uh, the pattern that you're able to see on your bee. And they also give examples of uh, how they would like you to photograph the bees uh, when you send them in for, for uh, if you choose to participate in their citizen science. But uh, I'm pretty sure what's living in my bird feeder is uh, uh, Bombus impatiens, that's our most common species. It's the eastern or common bumblebee, and um, its markings pretty much match what you see here on this diagram. Um, when you look at these at first glance, they kind of all look the same. They've got this prominent spot on the thorax, but if you look at where the yellow goes, you can see, and this one's got a little uh, brown patch. It's not the rusty patch bumblebee that we hear so much about as an endangered species, uh, but the brown belted bumblebee um, has a little brown on its abdomen. Uh, here's the rusty patch here, and uh, you can see, kind of see, that there is a, a difference in where those markings are um, apparent. But anyway, uh, beespotter.org, if you're into bees, it'd be a neat, uh, neat uh, website for you to check out. Um, I just got one more quick thing I wanted to share, uh, and this is uh, going back to the, uh, the emails again. Uh, we got an email, a uh, couple of emails. This is back in, in May, but I saw one of these characters over the weekend, and I thought, oh, you know what, let's bring this up one more time, because we do hear an awful lot from people who are curious about snakes. Uh, on May 15th, um, I got an email from Suzanne, uh, who found a snake, and she thought that it was a Kirkland snake, which um, is kind of funny. It's actually, um, uh, Kirkland is the brand at Costco. <laughs> um, Kirtland, uh, like the warbler, is the name of the, uh, of, is the snake. So I R T L A N D is the uh, snake species she was going after, but I don't know. You know, if, if Costco gets into the snake business, I think I'd 
probably be over there getting a big warehouse size quantity because I do love my snakes. But anyway, um, so she uh, they had a question about a snake and then um, uh, about 10, 11 days later, I heard from a gentleman um, out, uh, what is that, oh, uh, down near Ottawa. Um, he uh, also saw a snake. Um, I'll show you the pictures that they sent. Now here's Suzanne's snake. Um, and then here by comparison is a Kirtland snake. Um, I've never seen a Kirtland snake in the wild but we can kind of break down uh, the differences. Um, Kirtlands are uh, somewhat aquatic in nature, um, but they're not a true water snake. You'll see the Kirtland snake has a black head. Uh, uh, and th this head can sometimes be green. Um, it's got uh, kind of a dotted pattern down the back, uh, whitish sort of a chin. Um, Suzanne's snake here, um, you can see that it's got uh, a brownish color to it as opposed to black. And then it's got these bands around the neck. See how the, the color goes, the dark brown goes from one side all the way over to the other. Um, it's a band, it's not a blotch. But as we go down the body of the snake, those bands kind of break up. You can see they're starting to break up here. And then as we get to the kind of the middle of the snake, we've got alternating blotches. So we've gone from solid bands across the neck to alternating blotches down the back. You can see a little bit better in Travis's snake. This is the picture he sent. So here's the bands um, going down the neck. And then as we get to the mid part of the body, we've got our alternating blotches. This is a northern water snake. Um, very, very common, and they're not just in the north. If you go down south, you can see them as well. Well, poor Travis, he thought he was looking at a uh, venomous cottonmouth. You'll see um, how heavy-bodied these snakes are. The other thing about uh, a Kirtland's snake is that they're, they're pretty small. They top out, um, they're under two feet in length. A, a big northern water snake can get to be about three feet. Um, yeah, that's kind of pushing it. But the, the, the girth, the, the, the very, very um, uh, broad snakes, and they use that to their advantage when they're uh, trying to uh, display to discourage you from coming near them. They'll kind of puff out even more. They flatten their bodies out. They also can flare their jaws out. Um, if you've done any um, you know, investigating of uh, venomous versus non-venomous snakes, you'll know that one of the things you look for with a venomous snake is a triangular shape to the head. And um, here, this snake has not flared its jowls out, but um, it's uh, probably getting close to that point. I think it was getting a little bit agitated at all the attention it was getting. Um, let's go back one more time. Um, now this is something you won't see in any field guides. Um, it's just something I look for. Um, water snakes have crazy eyes. So when we look at where the eye is here on our Kirtland snake, um, you'll see that it's it's kind of you know right where you'd expect an eye to be, um, looking kind of out and around. When we look at a water snake. Uh, sense when you figure they're in the water all the time. Uh, their eyes are positioned higher up on their head and it, 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 makes a, it gives them kind of a, a look as though they are uh, ready to, to get up and, and get after you, which they often do. Um, they are not a venomous snake, but they do have uh, a lot of teeth. Now, uh, non-venomous snakes, their, their teeth are really small. They're a millimeter or less, but they're really sharp. Uh, and um, they can uh, bite uh, water snakes more than any other snake around here. You know, a lot of times when we're talking about wildlife, we'll say, oh, don't worry, it's more afraid of you than uh, you are of it. But um, that's not the case with water snakes. They're pretty bold, and uh, they'll even come after you. Uh, I don't want to scare you, but um, they, they have been known, um, say like, you know, seven times out of 10, they'll go the other way. But if they're um, pursuing uh, some food or if they really don't want to move, they'll stand up to you. I remember one time I was, 
I was actually trying to catch a water snake um, down in Wabansi Creek in Oswego. That's, a, that's actually a really good place to go and, and see uh, lots of northern water snakes. There's a, a bluff right behind the uh, Oswego Library. And I was uh, coming up to this, this water snake that was in the shallows, much like uh, Suzanne's snake was. And uh, upstream, there was a woman with two little boys and their dog. They had a Doberman Pinscher, and the little boys were in the water with the dog, and they were splashing and having a great time, and they were coming downstream towards the snake. And so I, I pretty much figured that um, uh, I wasn't going to be catching that snake. It was going to you know, disappear. Well, no, it didn't. It actually raised its head up out of the water, looked at the boys and the uh, dog, and then started swimming towards them. So uh, what ensued was um, <laughs> not hilarity, but uh, it did, there was a lot of splashing, and um, I was able to catch the snake in um, Allay the Mom's Fears, because she was, as people often do, thinking a snake in the water is venomous. Um, it, I never, I never would have predicted that a snake, any kind of snake, would go after, uh, go towards uh, two boys and a dog in the water. But uh, so anyway, they are a very, very common part of our um, riverscape. Uh, they also occur in a lot of our local retention ponds. Uh, not venomous. Uh, they are great eaters of fish and tadpoles and frogs, help keeping those populations healthy. Uh, oftentimes going after um, injured fish. A lot of times, you know, people catch a little fish and they rip the hook out and they throw it back in. That fish isn't doing so good. These guys will clean those up for you. Um, and with that, I think I'll stop sharing and um, we'll open this up and we'll see if anybody has any questions or stories. We can take stories too. Hey Pam. Yeah. This is Greg. I was interested hey, in the in the cicadas, the the um the uh the brood thirteen cicadas. The yeah. Ones that, the ones that split off. Um, yeah. In so are they still out of sync? Are they? Is there still a? Um, it's yeah. A brood that comes out four years early, earlier than the rest of the brood, still it, to this day. Yeah, and and. It's, it's a crazy sort of a thing. Um, there's a couple uh, uh, good resources. There's a, there's a gentleman, some of you may recognize the name, Carl Strang. Carl worked at the DuPage Forest Preserve District for, oh gosh, decades. He produces every year a, a guide to singing insects of the Chicago region. Um, he's been tracking this um, a straggler set of brood 13 and he's got maps he has a if you google uh, uh, natural inquiries that's his blog uh, Carl Strang and Strang is s-t-r-a-n-g um, you can look at uh, where he's been able to find them but yet for some reason they got off sync uh, in 1969 but they have appeared every 17 years since then um, I remember in 2003, I saw some at the Morton Arboretum and um, thought it was kind of cool, but didn't really do much research on them at the time. But it's, um, it, for, they, they are a 17 year species, so they've continued with that, but some kind of blip happened in 1969. And uh, they've been four years off ever since. Thanks, thanks, Pam. Oh, sure. Anybody else? Questions or stories? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I was talking with our marketing person today and I said, um, uh, you know, she had her mom sit in last week so that she could kind of keep an eye on how things were going and if I was behaving myself and everything. And I guess I passed because I got to come back again this week. But um, I am going to try in future weeks to have a preview. Uh, I didn't get to it this week, but. Um, uh, well, uh, so, you know, you can then decide if you want to come back again uh, the following week, but uh, we'll be working on that um, for the coming weeks. And then any suggestion, I'm always open because this Zoom uh, platform is still kind of new to me. Um, we are working uh, on getting some sponsors and then maybe taking this over to uh, YouTube. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how that goes, but um, it's uh, definitely still a work in progress. 
of um, anybody else have a question? Story? I have one, Sarah. Yeah, hey, Sarah. <laughs> so just last night in the rain, I saw a snapping turtle crossing the road okay. on Prairie Street while they're doing all this road construction in Batavia. Okay. And it's, it's probably four blocks from the river. It's not that close to the river. And okay. it was a snapping turtle, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 feet across, no, oh, 10, <laughs> 10, <Whoa! laughs> uh, maybe 10 inches, not a huge snapping turtle, but it uh -huh. was in the area where they're doing the road construction. And so I tried to use your method where you pick up the back. I don't know. It didn't work last night Oh no! in the rain. Where you, Cause last week you showed us a video where you pick up the back of the shell and yeah, you kinda, get your hands like, underneath barrel it. Anyhow, it didn't work. The snapper tried to snap me. Um, oh, no. Do you still have all your... I still have all my fingers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a towel with me, and I tried to just get her out of the construction zone. So uh -huh. I'm worried about the eggs because they're in, you know, it was all gravel from the construction. Do you, so do you think it was a, a female laying eggs? You think? Oh, I'm sure of it. It was definitely mm -hmm. a snapping turtle. And, yeah. Anyhow, um, she didn't want me to do the method that you taught us last week. Well, tell you what, sir, here's your home. You go find her and you bring her back. <laughs> I'll try again. <laughs> we'll have a talk with her about how you are just trying to save her life. <laughs> and she needs to go with Flo. <laughs> but, um, I, I can't remember. Did, did that um, video have the, the, the car mat? Part of they it. did not have. They, I've heard of the car mats okay. before, and they did not have the car mat thing in that video. Okay. Which is okay because I couldn't get my car mat out anyhow. <laughs> well, next year when we do the snapping turtle reminder, maybe we'll say for turtles of you know 14 inches or more, <laughs> maybe that that 10 inch shell is uh, just a little too close for comfort, huh? My comfort, anyhow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you're still all, you know, together. And, uh, we'll keep that in mind for next time. Good to know. Yeah, and if the snapping turtle weighs 40 pounds, you can't do that video, that YouTube video. Yeah. Either. <laughs> <laughs> We've experienced that. Yeah, they're... Um, uh, well, they're such a, a prehistoric creature, and you, you know you want to help them, but at the same time, you got to keep yourself safe. And um, I know uh, um, yeah, something that um, you know, the, even professionals will say. There's a point where you just have to, you know, hope the best for the little turtle and or the big turtle. <laughs> keep yourself safe. Anybody else? All right, well then, if, if there's nothing else, I'm just gonna do just a, a quick little public service announcement. Um, and some of you may know, I, I had a bout with colon cancer a couple years ago. And so now I am an outstanding proponent for colonoscopies. So um, mine's day after tomorrow. <laughs> gonna be having my last meal. I'm gonna have some clear liquids here. <laughs> and uh, elderberry cordial a lot tomorrow. <laughs> but, um, I just want to uh, put that out there. If you haven't had one recently, there's really nothing to them. Um, and uh, don't do it. Cancer sucks. <laughs> so um, <laughs> everybody stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll meet you back here next week. Take care, everybody. You too. Thank you. So long. The dog. The dog. Cam. Yep. Can we get a, a cameo from Boker? Oh, of course. Hey, little man. Come on up. Eyes and shine, buddy. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so he was um, chewing on uh, a plastic container a little while ago. And uh, he, uh, he was in the other room, and I thought, oh, this is going to be the background. And um, let me see if I can back away a little bit here. You can see the whole 
the whole boat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so he, um, he said, he, I got him from the um, All Herding Breed Rescue down in Joliet. And I'd, I'd actually applied to them too. Oh, are you so sleepy? Are you so sleepy? I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I applied two years ago. And um, they're down in Joliet. And, I, and in fact, it was a KCCN field trip. I was going to go down there afterwards. And uh, they didn't have any open appointments. So uh, that was uh, enough of a delay for me to find out about another dog that needed a home. So I ended up adapting a, a nine-year-old dog two years ago. So uh, that brought me up to two dogs that were about the same age, but I just kept thinking I wanted, you know, a younger dog. So COVID strikes, I'm home, you know, quarantining, spending way too much time looking at dogs on the internet. And uh, I applied again to All Herding Breed Rescue and uh, look who I got. <laughs> I think he's a really big boy though. Um, he's, uh, I don't think he's gonna have the cattle dog uh, ears that stand up. I think his are gonna, oops, it's out of screen again. I think his are gonna stay flappy. Yeah. <laughs> He's, I know, I'm kind of crazy about him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe we can have a puppy play. Oh my goodness. <laughs> He's wagging his tail. Yeah, he's he's pretty awesome, and I'm so thankful to live uh, work here in a dog friendly sort of office. Um, yesterday, he got to meet Luna, the uh, office boxer. So we, she's ten months old. So they had all kinds of playtime. Nope, oh, he's gonna cut us off here. <laughs> so yeah, that's Boker. Thanks, Pam. He's really handsome and cool. Oh. <laughs> I'm kind of stuck on him. <laughs> Don't tell the big dogs, though. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> All right. You take care, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.